Good evening to everyone. And uh, we have uh, a few of our faithful uh, disciple members uh, along for the ride as we're Zooming this. And uh, you are uh, now uh, tuning in perhaps as uh, you view the uh, recorded version. And um, we're compacting things and putting it together in such a way that, uh, well, here comes Les now. Uh, we're putting it together in such a way that it, it, it uh, shrinks both the content of the classes, but also shrinks the, uh, the, uh, uh, the nature of uh, the course in, in its entirety. So we say hello to Les and Sheila. We're getting started here now. Um, we, uh, we're, having a computer. we're studying uh, chapters five and six today. And uh, when we when we uh, get going, uh, we'll uh, we'll um, then study a little bit about God's will, uh, because we're going to start to see God working His will out as people continue to uh, how shall I say it? blow it, <laughs> continue, continue to make a mess of it. And so uh, that will be our, our uh, project for tonight. Les, you had your hand up. Did you want to say something? Okay. No, I, I, I was... just, I'm having computer issues. Some computer I'm trouble. late getting in here tonight. Okay, okay. Well, we'll go on. We'll go on. Yep, I think my battery. Okay. Um, so uh, let's take a look at uh, number five as I... Uh, share that with you. And then um, as we uh, work on it, uh, we will uh, come back and uh, get the answers to the questions. Um, I give out worksheets uh, to all the uh, students who are doing this online. And uh, folks at home, if you're watching the recorded version, if you want those worksheets, you have to let me know so I can send them your way. But we're on uh, lesson five, lesson five, the rebel people. The Exodus was the most significant event in the memory of the Israelites. It was common for the prophets and psalmists to recall this deliverance as they thought about Israel's developing identity. Not only did the Israelites write about it and pass the memory of the event on to their children, but they also marked the occasion with the symbolic liturgical act of Passover. The Passover meal commemorated God's liberation of the Israelites through Moses from the land of Egypt. This yearly ritual continues for Jews today. In many ways, as Tom Dozman will make clear, Passover and the Exodus event began the process of forging a national identity for the people of Israel. The Exodus from Egypt is the central story of salvation in the Bible for both Jews and Christians. The Passover Haggadah is the Jewish celebration of the Exodus. The biblical story of the Exodus attributes the first ritual of the Passover to Moses and the Israelite people during the night of their deliverance from Egypt. This night is special. Its unique character is underscored in the Haggadah service when a child raises the question for those eating the Passover meal, why is this night different from all other nights? The question requires the participants to remember the salvation of God in the Exodus. Through this ritual meal, the Exodus becomes a living force in the ongoing life of Jews, reaffirming in the very act of celebration that the night of Passover is truly different from all other nights. The Synoptic Gospels tell us that Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Passover Haggadah on the night of Jesus' arrest 
inaugurating the passion of the Christ, which has now become Holy Week for Christians. One of the disciples would have asked the question, why is this night different from all other nights? And the ritual answer, of course, would have been the recitation of the story of the Exodus as it is preserved in Exodus 1 to 15. The Gospels tell us further that in reciting the Exodus, Jesus actually inserted himself into the story of the Exodus as the Passover lamb, becoming for Christians the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. As a result of Jesus connecting the Exodus story to his own story, Christians, like Jews, view the night of Passover as distinct from all other nights. Exodus 1 to 15 explains why the night of Passover is so special. The book of Exodus is a story about the importance of memory, both for God and for humanity. The story opens with the tragic situation in which all humans lack memory. Exodus chapters 1 and 2 clarify that many, many years have transpired since the events in the book of Genesis when God directed Joseph to bring his family to Egypt to live in harmony and abundance with Pharaoh and the Egyptians. That whole generation of Israelites and Egyptians has long since died. And those now living in Egypt have no memory of God or these past events, no rituals celebrating God's salvation of Abraham, no memory of Joseph's heroic role in Egypt. The same is true for Pharaoh and the Egyptians. The author tells us, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And without memory, the new Pharaoh has no way of understanding the Israelite people who live all around him. Thus, in the opening chapters of the book of Exodus, people only live in the present time, a time ruled by fear and mistrust. The new Pharaoh is threatened by the Israelite people and seeks power over them first by instituting slave labor and then by killing all the male babies of the Hebrews. The hero Moses is rescued from the death sentence, but he too suffers from lack of memory with no knowledge of God or God's past acts of salvation to his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is no relief from the cycle of tyranny and violence that has taken over life in Egypt. And even Moses' initial desire to save his kinsmen from oppression by killing an Egyptian is judged by a fellow Hebrew as an act of murder. Pharaoh catches wind of Moses' misguided attempt at rescue, forcing Moses to flee Egypt for the desert. God finally enters the story of the Exodus in chapter 3 by appearing to Moses in the burning bush, located on Horeb, the mountain of God. God's opening words to Moses are a formal introduction, described as a divine self-revelation. I am the God. But this is not all that God reveals to Moses through the burning bush. God combines the divine self-revelation I am the God with memory. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God not only reveals the divine character to Moses, God also introduces memory and tradition to Moses, recalling the past promises of salvation to his ancestors, which play no role in his life. The divine appearance to Moses continues throughout chapters 3 to 7. The extended introduction of God to Moses indicates that the story of the Exodus is a story about God's memory, not human memory. The opening chapters of the book of Exodus underscore that God's memory is permanent. It remains active even when human memory fails. 
The writer of the book of Exodus states, God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Divine memory prompts God to fulfill past promises, even when humans are no longer aware of them. The ancient Israelites, Moses and Pharaoh, may be trapped in the tyranny of the present time, but God is not. The Exodus is a story of divine memory and action. Memory forces God to enter human history, to save the Israelite people from slavery and death, and to create a new future by fulfilling past promises to their ancestors. Exodus 7 to 14 narrates the conflict between God and Pharaoh over the fate of the Israelite people. God demands the release of the Israelite people. Pharaoh resists, stating, Who is the Lord that I should heed him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. The arrogant response of Pharaoh sets the stage for an epic battle in which the weapons of war are the forces of nature, described as the plagues. God assaults Pharaoh with three cycles of plagues. Each cycle contains three plagues, and the cycles increase in intensity as they progress through the elements of nature, including water, land, and air. The plagues are intended to demonstrate the power of God to Pharaoh, persuading him to release the Israelite people. The continued resistance of Pharaoh leads to the central events of the Exodus in chapters 12 to 14. They too consist of three actions which further explore God's power over creation. The plague of darkness, the death of the Egyptian firstborn, and the destruction of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. The focus, however, goes beyond the natural elements of water, land, and air to the most primordial features of creation, light and darkness. These opposing forces penetrate to the very core of creation. God proclaims in the book of Isaiah, I am the Lord, there is no other. I form light and create darkness. The primordial character of these elements indicates that the plague of darkness in the unfolding drama of the Exodus is not a story about the night as opposed to the day. It is rather a story about the absence of light altogether. The plague of darkness is more like a black hole in space where light is not simply absent but consumed. Light, the primordial element of creation, is taken away in the plague of darkness. And this is the setting for the subsequent events of the Exodus. Why is the night of Passover different from all other nights? Because Passover takes place at the darkest moment, midnight, on the night when light itself is consumed. The scene is filled with foreboding, so much so that the darkness acquires its own personality, becoming a force of death at midnight, described as the destroyer. It penetrates every Egyptian home, killing firstborn children, the very essence of family life. But wherever the blood of the Passover lamb is placed on the doorframe, that home is inoculated from the plague of death. The blood is like a light able to turn darkness away. It is as though every home smeared with the blood of the Lamb is lit up, shining like a small star in a black hole, driving away the destroyer. The firstborn survive the ordeal, and the survival itself creates memory, which makes possible the question, why is this night different from all other nights? 
The survival of the Passover night is not the whole story of salvation in the book of Exodus. The conflict between God and Pharaoh progresses from the night of Passover to the confrontation at the Red Sea. Pharaoh continues to resist God's claim on the Israelite people. He gathers his army one last time and pursues the Israelite people through the night to the Red Sea, where the power of God over nature again takes center stage. God splits the Red Sea in two, allowing the Israelites to walk through the sea on dry ground. Pharaoh also sees his opportunity in this event, and he enters in pursuit of the people. But then, just as light returns to the story at the very break of day, God drowns Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. The biblical author describes the night of Passover as the night of vigil, in which God provided protection from death through the blood of the Lamb. Those who survived the night of vigil also experienced the salvation of God at dawn when Pharaoh and his army were destroyed in the Red Sea. The question in the Passover Haggadah, why is this night different from all other nights, can only be asked by a survivor of the vigil. The question creates memory for those who observe the Passover. And this sacred memory must be passed on from one generation to the next. The Passover Haggadah also creates hope, since the recounting of the past salvation of God also leads to a future vision, when all evil will be destroyed like Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. Jewish participants in the Passover Haggadah remember the night of Passover while also looking ahead to the return of Elijah and the New Jerusalem. Christian participants in Holy Week undergo the same process, recalling the Passover of Jesus on Maundy Thursday and the final defeat of evil at dawn on Easter Sunday. In remembrance of these things, the Exodus remains a living force in the lives of Jews and Christians. Okay. You got all that, I am quite sure. Mm. We'll do our best to uh, sort it out a little bit. Um, uh, <clears throat> I asked the question in the worksheet, what do you make of the fact that Dr. Dozman says that the Exodus is the central story of salvation in the Bible? Uh, that's a bold statement in, in some respects, because uh, where do we as Christians locate the salvation story? Easter. Yeah, Easter or in in the, the life and ministry and life and death and resurrection of, of Jesus. Uh, so yeah, we, we located it in, in uh, that moment um, of the death and resurrection of, of Jesus is uh, where we locate it. But he, when he says it's the central story of salvation, it is um, only if at the end he says it's connected to a vision uh, that um, that that includes Jesus. Um, it, it's it's a foretaste, so to speak, of, of the uh, person of Jesus. So, what is the Haggadah? Prayer book or reading? Prayer book reading, uh, but it's it's particularly uh, associated with what holiday? Passover, uh, the Seder. Well, well, the Seder is yeah. the meal. Passover. Uh, that's right. The Seder meal, uh, usually the youngest person at the table is assigned the responsibility of asking the uh, crucial question that he really 
unpacked beautifully, I think, through the through the rest of the story. And that question is? Why is, why is it like different from other nights? You got it. You got it. That's, uh, that's uh, absolutely crucial for us to, uh, to uh, understand as a beginning place. Um, and um, what, uh, what, what does the, uh, my back's itchy. What does the, uh, what does the, uh, that question cause in the minds and hearts of those people that are gathered on, um, for that, that sacred meal, the Seder meal? What is it, what does that question uh, elicit? recitation of the story of Exodus. The recitation of the story. And when you recite a story, you're also remembering. remembering. Now, uh, when Jesus takes on the, uh, the uh, Passover meal, he changes its meaning with significance. And yet the, the meaning has similarity in that Jesus says, do this in remembrance of remember. So, so we, as, as a Christian people with the bread and cup, we are celebrating uh, the, the remembrance of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And so uh, that's the purpose. That's the purpose of the Passover in the Hebrew faith, that's the, in Jewish faith. That's the purpose of the, the uh, new Passover or the uh, Last Supper or the Eucharist or whatever it is you want to call it. It comes by a, last, uh, a lot of uh, names. But uh, when that comes our way, uh, we have to listen very carefully to the word of Jesus where he says, do this in remembrance of me after the bread after the cup. As often as you eat this bread, you do so in remembrance of me. Drink this. Drink this in remembrance. And so we, we have this as a very similar task as the uh, Jewish folks do when they're celebrating the Passover meal. Uh, that gets into the next question. Uh, we, what do we call it? How did Jesus change the name or the meaning of it? Well, we already uh, talked about that. Um, the the Passover, well, it was the last plague, last uh, visitation of uh, trouble upon Pharaoh um, and all of the firstborn children uh, who uh, of the Egyptians then died, um, including the firstborn of uh, cattle and, and so forth. The only ones that were spared were those who did what? What did they do? Spread the lamb's blood on the doorpost. Okay, and this this lamb was sacrificed um, for the purpose of the Passover, and so that blood from the Passover lamb sprinkled on the doorpost becomes the the uh, crucial element, um, and the, the meaning then is changed when Jesus does what he inserts himself as the once and for all Passover lamb. Uh, so, so no longer is a sacrificial cult necessary uh, as they um, uh, find Jesus the first thing, or these, the perfect sacrifice. There's uh, no, no lambs needed to be killed anymore. You were gonna ask Walt? No. Okay. I, uh, I didn't have a question. Okay, good. Then um, in the next, uh, question that I uh, pose in Exodus one and two, Dr. Dozeman says that we become clear that many years have gone by. Um, it's estimated that between the time of Joseph and the time that this is all going on, there's around 400 years passing. Um, now, just remember they didn't have, uh, they didn't have library, uh, you know, their libraries were limited. Uh, also remember the, the literacy rate would have been way down. Uh, they didn't have uh, videotape to roll. Um, so you have to uh, put yourself into that era, uh, so to speak. Um, and when you imagine 400, I mean, you know, our nation isn't even 400 years old. So when you imagine 400 years passing by, 
what is the problem with that? What, what can occur uh, because of that passage of time? We have to keep retelling the story. That's right. If it's not retold, what happens? Forget. People forget. forget. And, you know, that's, that's what's going on here. Everyone over the passage of, let's just say 400 years, everybody forgets. Everybody forgets uh, who Joseph was. I mean, here's the guy, a Hebrew, who was second in command under Pharaoh. Uh, and everyone has forgotten him. Everyone has forgotten him. Uh, everyone, if they're forgetting Joseph, then they certainly are going to forget the three other characters known as the patriarchs. Who are the patriarchs? We begin with? Sam? I'm sorry? Jacob? Well, he's, he's third. Abraham? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Isaac. Joseph. Yep. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and Joseph is one then of the 12 tribes that eventually return from Egypt, which introduces a whole other uh, uh, segment of, of history. So with, there's no connection uh, to the patriarchs. There's no connection to Joseph. Everyone is forgotten. Pharaoh is feeling threatened by this uh, group of people that seem to live in one segment of his, uh, of his kingdom. And so what does he do to the Hebrews? Enslaves them. That's job one, enslave the Hebrews, put them to work, hard labor, hard labor. What else happens because of his feeling of being threatened? Hmm. All of the male children, firstborn oh, male children of the Hebrews are killed. That's right. Moses escapes. Moses escapes and actually grows up in the Pharaoh's palace of all places. Uh, and um, it's kind of like, uh, um, I, I was doing a little presentation on John Wesley here not long ago in the history of uh, United Methodism. And in that history, John Wesley at age six, the, the uh, house in which they lived in Epworth, England caught on fire. And all of the children of Susanna Wesley escaped, except John. And so the townspeople stood on one another's shoulders and plucked him from the, uh, from the, the second story. And John Wesley was saved. Uh, and from that moment on, his mother called him a brand plucked from the burning. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was, for, for John Wesley, what that came to mean was that he had been, been saved for a purpose, but he didn't know what that purpose was yet. And so his life as it unfolded was, uh, was uh, uh, it kind of a, a life in search of the purpose for which he was saved. Moses, let's look at it from the similar perspective. Moses, Moses was saved by the wisdom of his mother. Um, his sisters were were uh, shrewd in the way that they handled uh, Pharaoh's daughter. And all of the consequence is Moses was saved, but he wasn't sure why. He wasn't sure why. Um, eventually he uh, murders the, uh, one of the uh, servants of Pharaoh and escapes uh, to, uh, to uh, well, it's, it's, the Negev Desert, it, but I'll, I'll give you a map of that momentarily. But um, so Moses is saved from this, this murder of, of uh, the firstborn of the Hebrews, all because Pharaoh felt threatened. Uh, and his life then kind of turns into a, a, uh, a search for what is it that I've been saved for? Uh, Exodus 1 verse 8 the author of the book of Exodus says very clearly, um, now what? A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph, did not know Joseph. So, you know, over the passage of time, a lot of things get forgotten, including the importance of this particular Hebrew in the whole history and survival of, of the kingdom of Egypt. In Exodus verses or chapters three through seven, 
what happens? What happens? Starts in chapter three. I think I'll pull up a map now just to uh, show you where things are happening. Moses went to, Moses got married. <laughs> Yeah, well, first he, first he ran away because he had killed the servant and the Pharaoh was kind of after him. And uh, as he ran away, he goes over here in, in this desert area, but settles down in this section, where, as Sheila says, he got married. Seemed to be living a nice life. He, yeah. he, he left alone until chapter three tells us what happens to Moses. He meets he God at the burning bush. Yeah, meets up with the burning bush. Wouldn't you like to have that happen? And the burning bush, uh, <laughs> while it was burning, was not consumed. So all, all kinds of strange things going on for Moses. And he um, uh, comes to uh, the base of Mount Horeb in the area where he and his uh, father-in-law and his wife and, and all the rest of the family were living. And uh, at the burning bush, Moses receives his, excuse me, receives his orders, and he is to go back uh, to, into Egypt and set the Hebrew people free. Okay, so, so we have that section of, of history going on there where um, Moses receives his call, and now as a part of that call, um, he, uh, along with God, uh, hears the cry of the Hebrews. Um, out of their slavery and then of course um, becomes the agent of of the freedom for the Hebrew people from their slavery now um, what we kind of have to think of this as um, Moses remember he was he was saved as a uh, you know as a Hebrew from a young age in the kingdom of uh, the, the uh, care of uh, Pharaoh's family, uh, his daughters. And so he had a position of favor in, in all of this, uh, killing the slave or, or killing the Hebrew, I'm sorry, killing the Egyptian master um, uh, caused him then to run away. And that's where he receives his call. And his call is to go back into Egypt and, and, um, uh, set the people free. Now, the reason I re rehearsed that one more time is notice how, how um, God in the burning bush causes Moses to remember. He causes Moses to remember. And that remembrance then has to turn into action. action. Now, remember when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, um, you know, we can do a lot of remembering and it's kind of nice, you know, I enjoy that. Uh, I was supposed to have my uh, 50th uh, high school uh, reunion last year. Of course, COVID took it over. So we're making plans. I'm vice, I was vice president of the class. So I was in on some of the plan making and uh, trying to get all that together. It just got lost, but uh, it's been fun reconnecting with some, some of those uh, well, they're all old people now, and I, <laughs> I, but but reconnecting with them, because when we reconnect, we're also doing remembering, and some of that remembrance has already turned into action. Um, I'll just say one example is you know some one of my good friends' mother died uh, over the course of this, and uh, as a consequence of that, everybody kind of surrounded that person in, in love and it just just recently. And so remembrance, <laughs> you know, do this in remembrance of me as Jesus says, remembrance has to turn into action, has to turn into action. And so Moses could have put his shoes back on and left the burning bush and not done a thing. But uh, God, uh, God's uh, call to him to remember turned Moses into uh, a, an opponent that Pharaoh had every reason to fear. I'll drop that back off of there. 
Uh, Exodus 7 through 14 speaks of the battle. Uh, what happens in the battle? God parts a red sea. Well, that's, that's the last act. That's the last act of the battle. That's for sure. Right. But in this uh, back and forth between Pharaoh and Moses, we have what first? What was it? The snake? Well, you, we don't have to go episode by episode. Uh, yeah, but he th throws his staff down and it turns into a snake. And Pharaoh said, that's nothing. My magicians can do that. And somehow or another, they did it. But, uh, but, but then the stakes get higher and there's all the uh, nine plagues are visited upon, uh, upon uh, Egypt. Uh, all kinds of uh, crazy things begin to happen. Uh, and uh, Moses is God's agent in this and wants these to be uh, the means by which Pharaoh would agree to let the people go because, uh, uh, you know, Moses is showing God's power. But Moses, or, or the king, or Pharaoh, uh, is noted for, uh, this, is, uh, this is found in uh, Exodus 7 through 14 a lot. Uh, what is uh, Pharaoh noted for in all of this back and forth of plagues? Well, it was kind of stubborn. Stubborn. Yeah, um, I think it's labeled hardness of heart. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the only thing finally that softens up Pharaoh's heart is the 10th tenth, the tenth plague, so to speak, or the Passover. And uh, Pharaoh loses his own son, firstborn. And along with his own, then the rest of Egypt, uh, is in brutal mourning. I mean, you you know, we can't even begin to imagine um, what that must have been like. Uh, but that causes Pharaoh to finally release the Hebrews and uh, a, a vast crowd um, begins to prepare to leave Egypt for the promised land that Moses is going to lead them toward. Um, you know, so through the contest, the power of God is is demonstrated, and as Les has led us to it, uh, the final straw um, is you know Pharaoh's Pharaoh's heart gets hardened again, and um, even after the uh, of the Passover uh, uh, loss of uh, sons, even after that, his heart is hardened again and gathers his army, and they're in hot pursuit of the Hebrews pin them up against the Red Sea, and uh, God delivers them as uh, Pharaoh's army is destroyed in the midst of the sea. Uh, remarkable, remarkable story, and uh, part of uh, the record uh, that, uh, that leads us to uh, understand the release of, of the Egyptian or the Hebrews, but then also the direction of the Hebrews as they're headed toward uh, what was the promised land. Uh, land first promised to uh, Abraham. And so they return uh, to, the, um, to the land of the patriarchs. Uh, now remember too, what they, what they do when they get there is sort themselves out. Um, we, we talked last week, I think, right? About how important genealogy is. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, genealogy is the determining factor as to what clan received which portion of the Holy Land. And you can look at maps. I, I didn't call one up, but you can look at maps having to do with where the families settled. Um, maybe I can grab one here during the next uh, film clip and, and uh, I'll show it to you. But they, they, they settle in, in different areas, the 12 clans. And uh, of course, uh, um, during the early history, before Israel and, uh, took a king, uh, those clans were the, the form of governance. And uh, we'll listen to, to the scriptures as, as they speak of the rise of the judges. Uh, who were the judges? Um, well, they were the agents of, of Hebrew uh, um, law or Hebrew organization 
before the king arose. Uh, the, the first king being Saul, then, then David, then Solomon, and then it all falls apart again. <laughs> but uh, these tribes settle all through Israel in what was the promised land. So we'll, we'll get into that uh, in a little bit. Any other uh, observations you made in that presentation that you need? Maybe you wrote a question down that you'd like to talk about. Anything else there that I may have missed or? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to uh, get us into a new share screen then of uh, the next uh, presentation, which is uh, number six. And if you'll hold steady with me. The giving of the Torah, the law, to the people of Israel is central to the identity of the people of God during their transition from life in Egypt to their potential life in Canaan. Under God's covenant, freedom came with responsibilities. Understanding this context for the giving of the law within the biblical narrative is key to allowing us to be more sensitive to the various regulations prescribed within the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Listen as Cheryl Anderson guides us through each of the and helps us understand how they should be viewed within this context. And listen in particular for the implications of these fundamental commandments for our own day and time. In the first chapters of the book of Exodus, the Israelites are slaves in Egypt and have cried out in misery. God has observed their misery and commissions Moses to lead the people out of Egypt and out of their oppressive conditions. God's work here involves not just taking them away from negative conditions, it also involves moving them toward positive conditions, toward the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The journey from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land does not occur overnight. There is a transitional period, time in the wilderness, and it is in this wilderness setting that God sends the law. That law is found in the Torah, a collective term for the first five books of the Bible. The Torah, along with two other sections, the prophets and the writings, constitute the Hebrew scripture. The Torah is referred to as the law with a capital L, However, it should not be equated with the various laws found there, since the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy contain more than just specific laws. These five books contain powerful narratives, and the particular laws are set within the context of those narratives. Consequently, it's best to think of the Torah as a body of instruction outlining God's relationship with God's people through both its narratives and its laws. In fact, the narratives tell us why we should follow the laws. In Exodus chapter 19, we're told that just before giving the laws, God tells Moses to say these words to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Clearly, the laws are given as an essential element of the covenantal relationship between God and the people of God. Furthermore, according to the biblical story, God sends the laws after the Exodus. Obedience to God's law then 
is the people's response to God's miraculous and gracious deliverance on their behalf. When disparaging remarks about legalism are heard today, keep in mind that the law is an act of God's self-revelation, providing a way for the community of faith to know God and remain close to God, striving to be the priestly kingdom and a holy nation that God would have them become is what it means for the Israelites to live up to their covenantal responsibility. From this perspective, the Torah shapes their identity as the people of God. Within the Torah are three major law collections, the Book of the Covenant found in Exodus, the Holiness Code found in Leviticus, and the Deuteronomic Law found in Deuteronomy. However, according to the biblical narrative, the Ten Commandments, also known as the Decalogue, are given before these other laws. Rather than being the kind of law used in a judicial system, the Decalogue offers policy statements or general principles concerning the requirements of an existence in relationship with God. We are so familiar with these brief statements that we assume we know what they mean. We may know the letter of the law, but do we understand the spirit of the law, the underlying rationale for the law? On closer examination, we might find that the Ten Commandments can be applied more broadly in today's world than we ordinarily think. For instance, the first commandment against having other gods means having an exclusive relationship with the God of the Exodus. But the spirit of the law further challenges the faithful to not have any other priorities, such as earning more money or any allegiances to groups or communities that take precedence over their commitment to God. The second commandment's prohibition against creating idols has been interpreted to mean having no physical representations of God. But more fundamentally, this commandment asserts that God cannot be a human creation. We cannot write up a list of divine attributes or qualities, no matter how long it might be, and feel that we have arrived at the totality of God's existence. We have to respect the ultimate mystery of the divine nature. The intent of the commandment against taking the Lord's name in vain seems to be the banning of profanity. More accurately, though, as the verse is translated in the New Revised Standard Version, it is a prohibition against the wrongful use of the Lord's name. So the third commandment forbids claiming God's name and power for our own selfish purposes. The commandment to remember or keep the Sabbath calls to mind God's own pattern of activity and rest in creation and emphasizes the need for balance in daily life. We need to work, but our lives must be more than endless ambition and productivity. We should make time to nurture relationships with God and with those around us. And as the fifth commandment tells us, one of the most important relationships to nurture is the one with our parents. Traditionally, we think of biological parents as those who should be honored, but today, blended, adoptive, and extended families should be included as well. The spirit of this commandment, however, would have us treat with dignity and respect, not just the elders in our own families, but all of those in our societies who are no longer part of the workforce. The commandment against killing is absolute in form, but not in practice, because the taking of human life through war and capital punishment does occur in the Torah. Consequently, there remains a degree of ambiguity about the interpretation of the sixth commandment in today's context. At the very least, this prohibition means that human life is precious and should never be taken lightly or without serious reflection and deliberation. Furthermore, this commandment would have us go beyond physical violence and recognize the harm that anger and verbal abuse cause another person, as Jesus does when he refers to this commandment in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 
through 26. From that perspective, upholding the sixth commandment would have us limit attitudes and behaviors that kill the human spirit, even in the absence of any physical harm. In their ancient setting, the laws against adultery applied only to a married woman and not to a married man. In other words, a married man did not commit adultery if he had intercourse with a woman who was single. Adultery occurred only if he had intercourse with a married woman. Today, these laws are reinterpreted in the community of faith and their application is extended to cover both married men and women. As a result, the seventh commandment emphasizes mutual responsibility, faithfulness, and commitment within relationships. The commandment against stealing is usually thought to prohibit the taking of another's property. However, its purview is so broad as to prohibit kidnapping a person too. Consequently, the spirit of the Eighth Commandment condemns depriving others of their property or of their ability to live their own lives to the best of their abilities. According to the Ninth Commandment, bearing false witness, telling a lie in judicial proceedings, undermines the integrity of a community's institutions. Indeed, telling the truth is so important to the life of a community that underscoring the need for the truth in all areas of one's life is a reasonable extension of the commandment. Finally, the commandment against coveting is usually thought to cover the things that another person possesses. But the harm caused by coveting one's tangible assets is also seen when another's intangible qualities, such as fame or prestige, are coveted. In fact, coveting is a damaging emotion precisely because it can lead to lying, stealing, cheating, and even killing, all of which are prohibited in the Ten Commandments and examples of which are found in the narratives of the Torah. According to the Jewish rabbinical tradition, there are 613 laws in the Torah. The Decalogue is only a small percentage of that total number. Nevertheless, the significance of the Ten Commandments should not be underestimated. Their basic precepts are repeated in the Covenant Code, the Deuteronomic Law, and the Holiness Code that follow. In fact, many of the laws found in these subsequent codes can be thought of as the specific regulations that carry out the general principles set forth in the Ten Commandments. Because the Torah contains so many laws, though, we need to consider an important question. How many of these laws apply to us today? For example, we might agree that the laws concerning sexual ethics are still valid, but what about the laws concerning business ethics? Are we as sure about the validity of the Deuteronomic law that prohibits the charging of interest on loans to a member of the community? Similarly, should we observe the law concerning the Jubilee year in Leviticus, when debts are forgiven, debt slaves are set free, and their ancestral lands are returned to them? In today's context, observing the law of the Jubilee might mean that the international debt of developing nations is forgiven, or that family farms lost through foreclosure should be returned. These laws in the Torah were given before the Israelites entered the Promised Land, and that fact is important to remember. Once they had been slaves, now they were free. But with freedom came responsibilities under God's covenant and the requirement to act in certain ways before God and with families and neighbors alike. The very presence of these laws reminds us now that to be a person of faith is not just a matter of what we believe, it is also a matter of how we behave. Okay, we're back again. Um, by the way, this uh, professor was uh, from the seminary I attended out in 
Evanston, Illinois at Northwestern University. And so uh, I'm proud of her, proud of her. Um, so with freedom comes responsibility. What is our responsibility? Obey the law. Okay, obey the law. Uh, that's it. Obedience is our responsibility. So the exodus has occurred, and the first opportunity to enter the promised land is rejected. They now find themselves in uh, a transitional time. It should not be traditional. It's transitional. And in this transitional time, the Torah evolves. Uh, what is the Torah? First five books of the Old Testament. Okay. Has another name. Did you catch that? Law? Well, it's it, the books of law, uh, but not all of the books uh, contain law. Uh, so, so we have to be, you have to watch that, uh, but uh, they are often referred to as the books of law. Known the as covenant the covenant codes? What's that? The covenant code, is that it? it well, they, they sometimes refer to it as that, although that's more with relation to the Ten Commandments specifically. It's also known as the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch, ah, yeah. um, five books, so to speak. Um, uh, so that's an, just another name for it. So what does Moses tell the people in chapter 19? Anybody catch that one? That's... Um... They will be God's, you will be God's people. Does that mean they're, he's announcing they're his chosen people? Okay, uh, yes. However, as his chosen people, they are to obey his voice and keep his covenant. And so we see, we find that emerging here as a uh, part of the, uh, of, uh, well, it's, it's really an introduction to the receiving of the, uh, of the Ten Commandments. As it happens in 19, the commandments come in chapter 20. When we hear the word legalism, what do we usually imagine? Um, excessive adherence to um, tiny little aspects of the law. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, when we get to the New Testament, uh, who are the legalists? The Pharisees. <laughs> yes, you aren't right. You 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 got it. That's, uh, the Pharisees become known as the, uh, the beyond legalists. They're so narrow-minded. They're busy picking at nits, and uh, and they they are the ones who who as as Walt described, they're they're it. And, uh, and so we have to watch out for those as they begin to appear. How does Dr. Anderson describe the law in response to legalism? Um, Nikki said uh, something about having as, adhering to the laws excessively. Um. Okay, uh, yes, that would be what legalism is. However, what we're looking for uh, is, is when, when God gives the law to Moses, uh, he's not doing, he, he wants the people to keep the law. There's, there's no question about that. But he is, he's also in giving the law to the people revealing himself. Uh, and so when we, when we think of the law as God revealing himself, then what he really is after is the people's response to keep the law, to keep the code, to be obedient. And where it goes off the rail is, uh, and, and I'm gonna show you this uh, in, a, in a few moments, uh, we're gonna look at something that sends it off the rail. Uh, is when, when legalism emerges rather than keeping the covenant, rather than being obedient people to God himself. So, so keep that in mind. We're going against getting noise. Are others getting noise? Yes. That might be my computer fan. It's kind of loud. Okay. Um, it's like a humming noise in the background. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's my computer fan. I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. Oh, you fixed it. You fixed it. So, uh, um, so we have the law over and against legalism. Just remember that the two don't necessarily go together. Okay, that's where we're after. Um, there are three legal codes that are delivered. Exodus is the covenant. The covenant code. Covenant. Leviticus is the book of holiness. Code of holiness. The holiness code. The holiness code. Yeah. And then Deuteronomy is the Deuteronomic law. Law. The Deuteronomic Good. law. So those are the three different legal codes that emerge, and you'll be getting into that a little bit in next time, uh, next week's readings. But first, in Exodus 20, uh, we have what's called the Decalogue. Um, and uh, essentially, this is the heart and soul of the covenant, covenant law. But now, um, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this because we could, you know, each one of these deserves a sermon and I don't have any ready to go. So, uh, um, <laughs> What I would like you to see is the first five have to do with relationships. Okay, the first five have to do with relationships. The second five are, are very much prohibitions um, and take a different turn than the relationship laws. Uh, the, the first five are positive, the second five are negative. In other words, do this, and then when you get the number six, don't do this, <laughs> okay? So, so I want you to definitely see that. Uh, first five are relationship, second six are prohibition, or second five are prohibitions. Um, so have no other gods before me. What commentary did she add to that? Not to have other priorities. Right, no, no other priorities other than God. And uh, she mentioned a couple priorities. Organizations, <clears throat> clubs. Yep. Um, money. <laughs> um, all of those uh, start to uh, take God's place. Okay, and the second one is have no idols or idols or graven images. Um, what did she say about that? said God wasn't a human creation and that you couldn't make a list of characteristics and then say you attained them. Right. Exactly. Good. Um, we, we can't, we can't make a physical representation that is God because we, we can't even touch the hem of his garment. Um, and so we, we have to be careful with that. But do not take the name of the Lord or do not take the name of the Lord in vain. We think of that as profanity, but she added a thought to that. Yeah, she said no wrongful use, not just profanity, but using the wrongful use of God's name. Yeah. Um, boy, I don't know. I, we uh, we saw all the senators raise their hands on uh uh, what day was it? <laughs> Whatever day it was. We were all trying to forget it. And uh, so help me God. <laughs> um, and uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows whether that was right or wrong use of, of all of that. But uh, I, think, I think that starts to push at it. Um, that uh, we, we think of it as a way in which we benefit ourselves. Uh, remember the Sabbath. What commentary did she add? Balance in daily life. Man, do we ever need that? <laughs> Finding balance in our daily lives uh, is a way. And, and uh, the balance that we're after is rest versus work. Rest versus work. Make sure that you have uh, um, that, uh, that balanced out. Uh, honor father and mother. I think she uh, uh, mentioned that, that it really should apply to extended families, too. Mm -hmm. And our elders in society. Yeah, other, other people in society, not just our own. That all people, <laughs> that all people, just not fathers and mothers, deserve 
respect, mm. honor, um, uh, a sense of dignity. Um, then we get into the do not, do not kill. She said there's some ambiguity in that. Um, why is there ambiguity? Because we go to war and kill yeah. people. Yeah. Or criminal justice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did like how she brought out the, the injuring of the human spirit with that. But I did not catch her reference in Matthew. Uh, it's in the Beatitudes. Uh, it's where Jesus is, uh, takes the formula. And he says, you have heard it said, um, you shall not kill. But I say unto you, anyone who looks at his brother or sister with anger um, and uh, abuses, that, that's adding it. But her words were uh, adds abuse to that. Uh, you've already uh killed them in a manner of speaking okay mm -hmm. uh you'll have to look that up in uh the sin sermon on the mount uh which i've been preaching on here just lately right and, um, but it's 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 a series of I, I think it's seven of them where jesus says you have heard it said uh, what i say unto you uh, actually it's matthew 5 uh 21 through 26 i think in that vicinity, Matthew 5, 21 through 26. Okay. You shall not commit adultery. Oh, how times have changed. <laughs> Used to be that only applied to. Uh, she said that only applied to married women. Yeah. Because yeah. men were taking as many wives as they wanted. Uh, you know, it's a polygamous society. Um, but... Uh, yeah. But in uh, our day, it applies to both, both sides, uh, both male and female. Um, stealing. Oh, she's both opening up. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> both property and preventing people from living lives to the fullest. Okay. Yeah. You. Uh, yeah, you can you can steal property and people, but the comment you made, Laura, is so so interesting, in that how does one how does one uh, prevent someone from living life to the fullest? Damaging their reputation. Excellent. Bullying. <laughs> um, yeah. However, however, that all unpacks. You're 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 on it. Okay, so keep that in mind that there are a lot of ways to steal, steal a person's uh, um, value in their selves. We can actually steal their lives. Uh, bearing false witness. Let's make that one easy. That's all. Just being truthful in all aspects of life. Boy, do we ever need that now. <laughs> we need truth. And then lastly, coveting. Um, this is, uh, you know, again, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time. We could spend a lot of time here, uh, but coveting causes all kinds of things to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. and it can be things that are tangible. Um, for instance, don't you like the lamp that's behind me here? Two lamps. Don't you covet those lamps? Well, don't. <laughs> So we can we can covet things. Looks like I'm looking at the piece of art uh, there, and uh, Walt took me on a trip to Switzerland with the Matterhorn behind him there. So so you know we covet things, but we can covet the intangibles too. Um, and of course, when coveting happens, all kinds of behavior can unfold. Um, so in the entire Torah, now this is doing the whole five, uh, the Pentateuch, in the entire Torah. She says, how many laws? 613. Yeah. And um, what I think begins to happen, well, there's a couple things that begins to happen. Uh, first of all, these 613 are developed to help you keep the 10. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Uh, but the other thing is we have to remember, as she pointed out, um, what... 
what was going on in the lives of the people. Now, you're going to run into uh, a law like uh, if, if, and this is one of the 613, if, you, if your ox gores um, another man's ox, then you should do this. Uh, or if, if uh, something happens whereby you are responsible for the death of a servant of another, you know, so all of this begins to unpack in, in greater detail, which then leads to what Walt was pushing us toward legalism, leads to legalism. It leads to the Pharisees needing to keep every one of those 613 laws without blemish or spot. And Paul says, what? You can't do it. Mm -hmm. He says, I was a great Pharisee and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And so um, imagine what the life of the Pharisee was like um, as, uh, as these laws are unfolded. For instance, um, I'm going to show you now uh, two films. Uh, they're very short, five minutes less. Two films. One of them has to do with, uh, they're both called Eruvs. Um, now, when you're, when you're going to keep the Sabbath, um, some very specific laws grew up around the Sabbath. You weren't even allowed to carry things. Um, you weren't allowed to carry your child. Uh, in current days, you weren't allowed to push them in a stroller. Why? That was called work. Work. You weren't allowed to uh, cook. Um, you know, uh, so what I want to show you, uh, first of all, is the Eruv having to do with cooking, all right? So tolerate this, if nothing else, tolerate it and have a little fun with it. Let's see here. Okay, uh, this, is, um, this is the uh, uh, Jewish law around, now you have to remember there are all kinds of, of Jewish uh, sects these days, and, and it has to do with the more conser conservative aspects of Judaism. And so this, is, uh, this one is having to do with the preparation of food so that you don't get caught uh, 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 cooking on the Sabbath, okay? That's kind of what we're looking at. Just have fun with it. Don't, don't worry about taking notes or anything. Just have fun with it. Amongst the 39 prohibited activities on Shabbat, many pertain to food preparation, from trapping and shechting, or planting and harvesting, through threshing, winnowing and selecting, to grinding, kneading and cooking. Essentially, foods must be prepared and cooked before Shabbat. Within certain parameters, food may be reheated. Under a principle known as Melechet Ochel Nefesh, some preparation of foods on Yom Tov for that day of Yom Tov is allowed. Most notably, the ability to transfer flame and to cook. Yom Tov cooking and candle lighting may only be done from an existing flame. Nonetheless, one may not prepare from one day of Yom Tov to the next. So, one can cook on Thursday for Thursday and Friday for Friday. But what about preparing for Shabbat? To allow dedicated and hot Shabbat food, rather than just cold Yom Tov leftovers, the rabbis established an Erev Tavshilin, or combining of cookings. In the words of the Ravad, the great 12th century Provencal rabbi, we combine the culinary needs of Shabbat with the culinary needs of Yom Tov to make them together. With an Erev Tavshilin, given that one has already commenced one's Shabbat preparation ahead of Yom Tov, one may continue to cook and bake for Shabbat on Yom Tov, just as one can cook on Yom Tov for the day itself. Ideally, an Erev should be prepared in every household, often, but not exclusively, by the person or even each person who lights the Shabbat or Yom Tov candles. Two pieces of food are required. One must be cooked, and the other is conventionally baked. The traditional examples are egg or fish as cooked foods and bread or matzah as baked. For Pesach, please use matzah. Ideally, the foods are complete, meaning they are whole 
and can be eaten as is. Ahead of Wednesday sunset, or Thursday in Israel, on occasions where there's just one day of Yontov before Shabbat, the foods should be set aside together or given to someone to hold together, and the bracha and declaration recited. Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotah Vertzivanu Al Mitzvat Eruv. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the mitzvah of Eruv. Bahadein Eruva, Yehe Share Lana La'afuye, Ulevashule, Ulevatmune, Uladluke Shraga, Ultakana, Ulemebad Kol Tsarkana, Miyoma Tava, Leshabta, Lana Ulechol Yisrael, Hadarim Vair Hazot. The Aramaic declaration may be read in English. With this Eruv, may we be permitted to bake and to cook, to insulate, to light a flame, to prepare and undertake anything necessary from Yontov to Shabbat for ourselves and all Israelites living in this city. The set-aside Eruv foods ought to be eaten on Shabbat. Some have the custom of using the baked food for Hamotzi and the cooked one for Sudash Lishit. Stressing the importance of the Eruv, some authorities hold that without an Eruv Tavshilin, one may not even light Shabbat candles. However, as you can see from the language of the declaration, the ambit of the Eruv extends to others. Accordingly, the local rabbis or Gadol's Eruv also covers his community, and this may be depended upon if one has forgotten to make an Eruv of one's own. Some poskim allow this leniency just the once, and all are agreed that one should not become habituated to it. The word Eruv is related to Arevut, as in the expression, Kol Yisrael Arevin Zelazeh, every Israelite has responsibility for each other. As we head into this somewhat strange Pesach, my appreciation to all who volunteer in the community. As you look out for others, may Hashem look out for you and yours, with blessings of health and happiness. Wishing you a Chag Kasher V'Sameach. Okay. Oh, hang on here, man. I got to... Whoa. Hang on here a minute.